千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. As always, I want to extend my welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. I would like to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware, as we are ready ourselves for this sacred process in the Tao with one another. I want to briefly recap the chapter title. Chapter six is the Valley Spirit chapter. Gu Shen Zhang. As we talked about previously, the Valley Spirit is a powerful metaphor that depicts various essential aspects of the Tao. So one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that the valley spirit, described as undying, inexhaustible, is a reference to the spirit or the soul that is within all of us. As the Tao is within us, we all reflect that aspect of the everlasting, eternal Tao. There are many other implications as well. So last time we explore the metaphor of the valley itself, and of course we started with a look at the chapter. This is a relatively short chapter with only six lines, and when we explored the sectional analysis, we were able to divide it up. Into three parts, three sections of two lines each: the beginning, the middle, and the end. So, in the beginning section, it talks about the Valley Spirit, and it connects it with the concept called the Mystic Female. Then, in the middle chapter, in the middle section. We connect the mystic female to the root of heaven and earth, so the gateway of the mystic female, meaning the entry point to the valley, is the root of heaven and earth, which is the source of everything. So today we will finish our discussion by exploring the concluding section. Which is the third section. Now, the valley itself, as I mentioned, has many implications. So, the openness of the valley spirit, spirit is one of the most important implications, one of the most important characteristics. The essence of the valley is that it is open, accommodating. And welcoming of all. It is a fertile place that embraces all the living things in it. There is this river flowing through the heart of the valley, providing irrigation to the crops, feeding the myriad things, including the human beings. So it is nurturing. It provides its protection. It provides its riches to everyone and everything. It is all the abundance of the valley that is free for everything in the valley. Last time we connected this idea to the concept of the Maitreya Buddha. So remember the Maitreya Buddha, not the Sakyamuni Buddha. 
a different Buddha, there are many Buddhas. The Maitreya Buddha is the Buddha to come in the future, in a future era, foretold in Buddhist prophecy. Maitreya Buddha had taken manifestation hundreds of years ago in ancient China, showing up as a portly monk. That image has become very widespread and popular. To be big is the symbolic meaning of being open and accepting. As we talked about, this Buddha was tolerant and giving, was good and generous. And these are the characteristics that lead to abundance. So previously, if you were to look at this particular statue, it might not register in particular why there are depicted so many kids climbing all over the Maitreya Buddha. Now you know this is meant to depict an attitude of openness and acceptance. It is okay to take advantage, quote unquote, of the Maitreya Buddha. It is fine. This Buddha will provide its protection happily to you. And this happiness, this generosity is what gives rise naturally to good luck. So most people know when they see the image of this Buddha that, oh, it's symbolizing good luck. So the teaching behind it is that it is the generosity of the Maitreya Buddha that leads naturally to good luck. If we were to emulate the essence of this Buddha, we too would become nurturing, generous, and giving to other people, and that naturally will lead to good luck, good fortune to us in life. So both the valley and the Buddha embrace this particular essence, this teaching of the Tao. Another aspect of the valley that is also important is about the immortality the undying of the valley spirit. So this one slide shows it all. Basically is saying that the metaphor depicts the seasonal changes in the valley. Every year, the valley is going through the four seasons. But regardless of how the seasons change, another year arrives and the cycle begins all over again. The valley remains the valley no matter what happens. And this is an indication about the human condition in the widest possible sense. That is to say, the essence of the valley is the soul inhabiting a particular human being so the valley spirit literally is a reference to the immortality of the soul. That is to say, no matter how many lifetimes you go through, no matter how many changes you experience, you're still going to be you. In this metaphor, the seasons map to the phases of life, where spring is the beginning of a lifetime. The summer is when you have reached the peak, the most active phase of your life. You are flourishing in your prime. Autumn is when things start slowing down, getting ready for winter. And winter time is the end of life. Or is it? Because with this metaphor, we know that spring is just around the corner. So the end of life is actually renewal of life. The conclusion 
as I mentioned, of a particular set of lessons that you go through in this lifetime, and the beginning of the next set of lessons that you will prepare for yourself. And that's a point that bears repeating. You yourself, in your highest form, know what you need to learn, what you need to experience, the lessons you need to absorb. You will make those determinations before you begin another lifetime with another set of challenges. Then we hold everything together to illustrate the concept of Tian Di Gen, which is the root of heaven and earth. In this particular graph, you will see the different levels of manifestation for this particular concept. We went from the universal level, where the source of everything literally is the source of universal creation, where all the galaxies, stars, and planets, all the heavenly bodies originate. We then moved from that universal level to a worldwide level, the planetary level, where we talk about just the world, our world. We then went from there to the biosphere, which is the part of the earth where living things reside. From there, we zoomed in to the human species and finally to the human mind. Now, when we talk about the mystic female at the highest first initial level of discussion, literally the term mystic female is talking about the female of the species of any life form. And this is talking about how all the living things, the vast majority, I should say, of all the living things we see in this planet, they all come from the females of the species, that is, biological procreation to produce the next generation. And this includes all the living things that have gender differential in the past, the present, and the future. We human beings belong to that, to those categories as well. Therefore, all human beings, past, present, as well as down the road, all born from the womb of the woman. Therefore, the mystic female is the source of life not just for all the living things in the world, but for all human beings as well. So that is the, the power of the metaphor. And we further delve into the human mind when we talk about the source of ideas. We talk about the brainchild. We talk about giving birth to a concept. And this is, of course, not just limited to women, everyone has the source, the mystic female within, that which gives birth, gives life to ideas. And again, this is not just the ideas that you have come up with, but the ideas from everybody. And not just everybody around you, but everybody who has ever lived. All the ideas, all the human beings who have ever lived on this planet, all of those came from this intangible yet powerful source of thoughts, concepts, emotions, feelings, ideas and inventions. The mystic female within all of us. So the root of heaven and earth 
is identified as the ultimate source for everything. This, as we talked about last time, was not unique to the Tao. In the Tao, we talk about the root of heaven and earth. And as I mentioned, in Zen Buddhism, in the Zen, six patriarch of the Zen tradition in the Platform Sutra spoke of the self nature that gives rise to 10,000 dharmas, 10,000 meaning all. And it is important to mention that when we talk about all dharmic manifestations, all things in your world, it is both the positive and the negative, all the good things and the bad things. All the good things that you have done, all the good things that have been done for you, all the bad things you have experienced, all the bad things that you are responsible for. Everything, literally everything. So last time we went through some examples of this rather radical concept that you are the source of everything in your life. We talked about the positive. How when you have done something good, the conventional thought is that, well, you know, I did other people a favor. I helped them. In reality, you are the source of that good thing. You are also the recipient. In the Zen Buddhism tradition, it is spoken of that you have accumulated merit, and that is for yourself. If you have done the good deed without attachments, if you did it without expecting some sort of return, some sort of reward or recognition, then what you have gained is personal refinement, personal accumulation of intangible merit, a good thing that you have done that works in small ways to transform you for the better version of yourself. Therefore, that being the case, nobody really owes you anything when you have done other people a favor. The good that you have done for them, you have also done for yourself. And this calls back to the interconnectedness of all sentient beings. You are connected to me, I am connected to you, everyone is connected to everyone else. That is why when you have done something good, it provides the potential for other people to also pass on the positive energy to even more people at some point. Karmic cycles dictate that these positivity will come back to you multiplied many times. Therefore, benefiting others in that sense is also benefiting yourself. When that is the case, it makes sense that the work literally is its own reward. It brings its own reward sometimes from sources that are unexpected and seem to be unconnected with the original good deed that you have done. It is only because we are in the material world, our perception is limited in this realm. We cannot see all the karmic connections. Nevertheless, when you live through enough of your life, you begin to see how true this really is. And the same applies in the other direction, the negative direction, that when something bad happens to you, you are a participating cause. You have determination in it, whether as a direct cause of it or contributing by 
not doing the necessary preventive things that you could have done. And it goes even further than that. There are questions that many will ask when they encounter this particular teaching from both the Tao and the Zen tradition, that one is responsible for all the negative things. And the question naturally becomes, well, what about children born into a horrible life? What about infants who die of terminal illness? How can they be the cause of their own misfortune? They haven't had a chance to do anything in this lifetime. They can't possibly be the cause. Well, it is an excellent question. And this was a question that one particular American psychiatrist was unable to answer for himself. You see, in his professional life, he was widely respected, highly successful, but in his personal life, his family had been struck by tragedy. And it is the very scenario we're talking about. His firstborn son died at only 23 years old, 23 days old, pardon me. And this was due to an extremely rare heart defect that occurred one in 10 million births. He and his wife mourned for months. Their hopes and dreams dashed. It was only until the birth of his second son that this emotional wound began to feel less painful. Nevertheless, the death of his first son as so young, 23 days old, remained this great unresolved question in his mind. Until many years later, when he had a profound spiritual experience. In that experience, he learned that his first son was actually a very advanced soul and decided to make a sacrifice to repay his karmic debt out of great love. The son wanted to send his father an unmistakable message that modern medicine could only go so far. Its scope was still limited. Upon learning this, the psychiatrist realized the truth of this revelation. Before his first son's death, he was at a fork in the road, choosing between psychiatry and internal medicine. When he saw for himself that all the technology and science in modern medicine could not save this tiny baby, his son, it made his mind up for him. This pivotal event in his life was the reason for his entire career in psychiatry. He went on to fulfill his mission in life, helping many people through the various aspects of his psychiatric practice and more as an author. What can we take away from this real life story? Well, notice that it was his son who decided to make the sacrifice. It was a trial that his son had determined from before birth. And another thing we can learn is that there is nothing simple or black and white about any death or suffering, including the death or suffering of babies. After all, we're all connected as one. A tragedy, terminal illness, or horrible life affects not just the child or infant, but everyone connected to that soul. And let me also mention just the concept of the immortal soul and multiple lifetimes. Even that by itself casts the whole 
tragic thing in a different light. The tragedy, suffering and death, happening to an infant is no less tragic. But keep in mind, the soul is immortal. The undying valley spirit still exists and will be moving on to its next set of lessons. Therefore, it makes sense that all things in life, good and bad, happen for a reason. A horrible fate you had to endure has a karmic reason in the background. We may not understand it at first. It may be a test, a trial, or just a difficult lesson you had decided you needed to go through even before you took on earthly existence. So this is the reality behind this teaching that initially may be difficult to grasp, but makes a lot of sense and gives us a lot of power to realize ultimately we are in charge. Let us continue now to the rest of the lines in chapter six. Line five says, it flows continuously, barely perceptible. So this is a reference to the Tao, to the flow of consciousness, to the valley spirits, to the root of heaven and earth, all of those things combined. Let me approach first with the two characters. You notice that the two characters are highlighted are the same characters repeated twice. Mian Mian. So they both mean the same thing. They both mean continuous. So this is literally continuous, continuous. In Chinese, whenever you repeat a character twice, you are calling it out for emphasis. Repeat characters always denotes emphasis. So this is emphasizing the flowing nature of the Tao. It is like underscore or highlighting. Think of this flow of the Tao as a stream of metaphysical energy. This is a never ending stream. It is ever present. We cannot see it, but it is always around us. Your consciousness is part of the stream as well. Your consciousness also is ever present and everlasting. Now, from what we can understand with modern day science, your mind is dependent on your brain to function. But in the study of spirituality, what we learn is that the mind is but an overlay of your true self or the soul. That is to say, the unique individual consciousness of your soul exists independently of your physical self which includes your physical brain. Please keep this in mind as this will become important later on in our discussion. Let's go to the next slide. We're working on the same line, but the last two characters. The last two characters literally means as if it exists. So we just got done talking about how the Tao flows, the consciousness flows because you are part of the Tao. Now it says as if it exists. Well, does it exist or not? What does that mean? In the translation, you'll see where it says barely perceptible. 
That is because when something is sensed, something can be sensed but not seen, its existence is in doubt. Is it there or is it not? So the Tao itself fits into this category. It is quite real, and yet it is not visible. We cannot see it. And that is only because the nature of the Tao is metaphysical. That is why it is beyond our physical senses. You cannot see it, you cannot hear it, you cannot touch it. It's beyond all of that. Hence, when it says barely perceptible, it is basically Lao Tzu saying that you can feel it, you can sense it, but not with your physical senses. Next line. Now, we look at the entire line together. It flows continuously, barely perceptible. The entire line is referring, as I mentioned, to the root of heaven and earth, the ultimate source of everything. And earlier in this chapter, we saw that the root of heaven and earth was synonymous with the gate of the mystic female. These are just different terms for the same thing. And that is, of course, prior to the mystic female, we spoke of the valley. The spirit of the valley is the mystic female. Therefore, the gate of the mystic female is the entry point, the ingress. It's the place where you enter the valley. Here's the bottom line. It is the creative, life-giving aspect of the Tao. When I say give life, I'm not just talking about giving life to living things. I'm also talking about, within the mind, giving life to an idea. Therefore, all of this are taking on the characteristics of the Tao, which I remind you, is a continuous flow that is imperceptible, but real. And now, line six, the final line of this particular chapter, again, will focus on the first two characters to see exactly what we're looking at. Yong zhi, meaning utilize it. You can also translate it as use it, utilize it or use it. A clear instruction from Lao Tzu that the Tao is meant to be used. It is meant to be applied to life. This is the reason why genuine Tao sages always emphasize the practical side of life. The Tao should be utilized in everyday activities. It isn't something to study over the weekend and then set aside during the week. It is something that should be with you every moment of every day. So, indeed, let me emphasize, it would be erroneous to contemplate the Tao, to read about it, to think about it, to study it, but never apply it, never actually put it to use. That I know is actually what some do. That is, they talk about learning from the Tao, studying the Tao, and yet I see from examples in their daily activities that they have not actually made a transition from intellectual concepts to practical actions in what they say and what they do. So that is a trap that I want to caution everyone to not fall into. Intellectualizing the Tao is not fulfilling the original purpose 
of Tao philosophy. The Tao isn't just about how to think, but what to do. I cannot emphasize that enough. Now, let's talk about the last two characters. The first character is negation character, means no or not. The second character requires more explanation. It can be misinterpreted as not diligent because the last character there, the final character of this chapter, in modern Mandarin, that is the character for diligence, for working hard. When you put not in front of it, it seems like it's saying, utilize the Tao, not diligence. What does that mean? Well, it is a misinterpretation. In ancient times, the meaning of that character, no longer used in modern times, is used up. It's a related meaning to diligence, because when you are very diligent in doing something, you use up your energy, you devote yourself to the task. So in that tangential related meaning, plugging it back in to this expression, this is actually saying that utilize the Tao, it is never used up. So that is to say the Tao is infinite. The more you use it, the more there is to use. The more you dig into it, the more there is to dig into. Therefore, we all have a duty to utilize the Tao as much as possible. So now, looking at this line together as a whole, using the Tao, being one with its flow. And I mention flow because the line right above it is emphasizing the flow with a repeat of the two characters, mian mian. Now, when it comes to creativity, this just means tapping into a creative flow that never runs dry. I previously talked about how a writer who understands this, able to tap into this never-ending fountain of creativity, writer's block is never a problem. There's always more. It just depends on you having the time and the inclination to write down what is coming at you. When you are in that experience, you definitely get the feeling that the creativity is coming from a source that is not even yourself, but something that you are connected to. And that is what I would call a universal source of creativity. All human beings have the ability to tap into it. Of course, an individual author will filter that flow through his or her own experience, his or her own style to create something that is unique. But this is the bottom line. This is the point that it never runs dry. It's always there for those that know how to access it. And it is also a way that achieves excellent results with little or no effort. In the Tao, from the beginning, we talked about how there's no strife, there's no struggle in the Tao, that when you are able to be one with it, Everything is a graceful flow. It's easy. The results are incredible, and yet the effort seems to be very little or non-existent. This all goes back 
to the valley spirits of the first line. Remember the image of the river that flows through the heart of the valley. That is about to become very significant. It symbolizes this mian mian, this never ending continuous flow. It just keeps going. In this metaphysical valley, the source of that river is infinity itself. So there's always more. So to prepare ourselves for that discussion, this is where we tie all the pieces together as a whole. We need to do a quick review of the whole thing. So we're going to do a section that ties everything together for this particular chapter. Let's start with this slide that is listing out all the different elements that has been mentioned that Lao Tzu has written in this chapter, and then we'll break them down one by one. We begin with the first element, which is the valley spirit, synonymous with the mystic female. So how does that metaphor apply to you? As we have talked about, this is the true self the self nature. So true self is the term that I use in the Tao to talk about the you that never changes, no matter what else about you changes. You can change your mind, you can change your memories, but you're still you. Self nature is the term from Zen Buddhism about the same thing. Different terms for the same thing, commonly known as the soul or the spirit. So this is the core of yourself. This is the truest part of you. This is the you that you experience directly. Then we get to the concept of undying, and never exhausted. The undying is from the beginning of the chapter, the never exhausted from the very end, the last line that we just looked at. This is a reference to the immortality of the spirit or the soul. As you saw in a previous slide, the valley itself goes through seasonal changes, but its essence remains unchanged. In a similar way, your soul goes through one lifetime after another, but you remain your essential self. Your connection to your fellow soul companions manifesting as your family, as your friends, those remain constant lifetime after lifetime. Next, we have the character for the door or the gate, which is synonymous in this case with the character for the root. They both are talking about the source for everything, all the ideas, all the thoughts, all the emotions. And this is indicating the mind or awareness. And higher level teachings in the authentic Tao tradition make this very plain. It talks about a gateway or portal to the soul indicating that this doorway is how we can reach the soul itself 
at least metaphorically speaking. Then we have the phrase, uh, this has been used uh, not just in this chapter, but previous chapter as well, 天地, heaven and earth. The meaning for that is the world, specifically your world. And what I mean by your world is your life and everything in it. When I say everything, I mean everybody and every thing, every object. Everyone you know includes everybody you have known in the past, as well as people you don't know yet, but will get to know in the future. So that, all of that is part of your world. And the root of your world just means that you can trace everything, everybody in your life, all the connections, all the relationships to your mind, your consciousness as the ultimate source. And also, let me be clear, your mind comes from your spirit or the soul. It is the source of the source. So the true self or self nature is the origin of everything. And in the beginning of our meeting today, I mentioned that this is the positive as well as the negative, the good and the bad, just everything. Next is where we get to the important part, the flow. Mian mian. Continuous, continuous, translated as it flows continuously. What is that? Well, it is the flow of the Tao, but when applied to you, the level of you, it is the stream of consciousness that you experience every moment of every day, right now, as a matter of fact. You already know that you have the ability to direct your stream of consciousness in any direction you wish. How you direct it is that you choose what you pay attention to and the direction of your stream of consciousness can be aligned or misaligned with the current, with the direction of the Tao. That's important too. When your direction, the flow of your mind is aligned with the Tao, you are moving in the direction of compassion, of the generosity of the Maitreya Buddha, being nice, being giving, being helpful. All of those are in perfect alignment with the Tao. But then you know that there is also times when you've been at less than your best. That is, you have darker thoughts. You have thoughts about getting back at someone, at inflicting some sort of pain. Let's be frank, we've all had those moments that is misaligned with the flow of the Tao. The more you engage in those directions, the more difficult your life becomes. And that is, it is harder and harder to swim up against the stream. So then next we have barely perceptible. And this is the nature of consciousness. What I mean by the nature of consciousness is that I want to point out, it's like the Tao. We don't fully understand it. What is consciousness? How is it created from the complex interactions of neurons in the brain? Some have asked the question, is consciousness an illusion? If it is illusory, why do we feel it with such directness 
and immediacy. Even as I speak these words right now and you're listening to me, at any moment, this instant, we can be in direct contact with our own consciousness. We feel it working. We understand it is with us. More than that, it is us. So how can that be explained? We simply do not have all the answers. Lastly, the practical utilize it or use it. That is, we must make full use of your mind. Now, as I mentioned, the mind is originating from the soul of the spirit. So fully utilizing your mind is also the full utilization of your spiritual self. It is exercising the soul so that it can refine itself. It can grow and develop into a better version of itself. Any changes that you make, any improvements that you make, becomes permanent in the soul. That is what you take with you from this lifetime to the next. So having seen all of these concepts expressed by the, the Tao, expressed by Lao Tzu, apply to you, it is now time to get more into the flow, to talk about the flow concept. Now, oftentimes we say, go with the flow. That's a popular expression. So what I'm trying to say is that the flow is not new to us. And as you know, when we talk about the Tao, we always talk about how the Tao flows in a certain direction. We just got done talking about how it is the same direction as compassion and generosity, love and friendship. So flowing along with the Tao means being able to enjoy the good things in life in a graceful and easy way. Conversely, flowing against the Tao Swimming against the stream, striving, struggling, expending a lot of effort, making little progress. Now, flow has gotten more attention in recent years because of the modern study of the flow state. It is a, an area of study in human psychology, the flow state. The flow state is something that psychologists looked at initially when they looked at artists and artistic expressions, creative expressions. Then they also looked at athletes and sports performance. They quickly discovered that whether it's our artistic expressions or athletic performance, the elite level artists and athletes, they all talk about getting into a groove where they can literally do no wrong. They talk about how it feels and without any prompting, they use the word flow in their description. So for the for extreme sports especially, and when I talk about extreme sports, I'm referring to high-risk athletic activities like wingsuit flying, base jumping, skydiving. That's where participants a lot of times will talk about being in the flow state, the state where they are fully immersed, can do no wrong, and they lose track of time. But then, upon further investigation, psychologists realize it isn't just extreme sports, it's any sport. And when they talk about artistic pursuits, painting, sculpting, etc., 
artists talk about being lost in the flow, this blissful state of creativity where their hands are guided by this unseen source where everything that they do comes out perfectly the way that it was meant to. That state of being, they realized, isn't just associated with artistic pursuits, but could apply to any activity, artistic or not. So from extreme sports to any sport, from creative endeavors to any activity at all. And indeed, is there anything that we do that we cannot do with an artistic flair? Everything that we do can be art. Sports themselves can be an expression of artistic merit. And any activities can be athletic in some way. So we're really talking about the flow state associated with everything that we do. It doesn't matter if, we're, if we don't happen to be painting something or engaging in a sport, we can tap into the flow state, which in our expression is tapping into the Tao. And that is what it feels like. We flow with the Tao and we experience a certain state. We can feel it. We feel this energized focus, the state of effortless concentration. So the flow state is what athletes will sometimes say, getting into the zone. And in the language of the Tao Te Ching, the zone, is the valley and getting into the zone is gaining entrance to the valley and when you are in the zone there is the focus and concentration there is also the total involvement and immersion in the process effortlessly you are one with what you're doing for an athlete he or she becomes one with the movement. For an artist, he or she becomes one with the art, complete immersion. It is also the ability to do the right thing without any worries, anxiety, or doubts. You just know that you put your hand there, it's going to be the right move. That you're going to be exercising, you're going to be executing a particular motion, and it's going to be the perfect motion. And the result of that, optimal results, outstanding, excellent results. But it all seems so effortless. That is the flow state. Remember, in this chapter, we talk about how the Tao flows continuously, barely perceptible, and yet it is something that we can tap into. Or what I say, entering into the valley. So how do you enter the valley? Well, you want to be one with the characteristics of the valley spirits, Gu Shen. That is, you must be receptive accommodating. You must be tolerant like the open spaces of the valley. That's number one. Number two, you must be nurturing, assisting, loving. You must be of service like the valley, cradling the myriad things. When you are able to exhibit, manifest, in those mental states, you are walking in to the valley. And you will begin to feel the flow state that you will enjoy the process of the activity. Time loses meaning. You have complete absorption. And 
It's intense and yet it's relaxed. It's the merging of everything. It's a loss of your sense of self. And yet you feel this control or mastery over the situation or activity. And you experience this activity as intrinsically rewarding. That is, the doing of it is the reward of it. It melts together action and consciousness. It's a balance between a skill and the challenge of the task. It's a fluidity between body and mind. And you are completely beyond the point of distraction. Either time feels like it's speeding up or slowing down. All of your senses are heightened. And action, awareness, synchronize to create effortless momentum. So this, we're talking about the flow of the Tao, where you perform at your best, at the limit of your abilities, where you learn and grow and act at the same time. So the question then becomes, how can we immerse ourselves in this flow? In other words, how do we use the Tao? That is the next slide. Use the Tao. Recognize the Tao in you. Understand that the stream of consciousness in you is a flow of energy, what I called metaphysical energy. I mentioned that you can direct the stream by choosing what you focus on. You choose what you pay attention to. Here, let me note that many people in the world let themselves be directed by external factors, such as the media, marketing campaigns. This influence of external factors can be overt, or it can be subtle. As Tao cultivators, what I suggest to everyone is that you must take control of the directing yourself. You must take charge. You must be the one to pick and choose what you pay attention to according to your own wishes for your own reasons. And this is because the stream, the stream of consciousness can flow along with or opposite to the Tao. As I mentioned, when you flow with the Tao, everything's easy. When you flow opposite to the Tao, everything becomes much, much more difficult. So the flow of this metaphysical energy, let me also say that it's an energy flow that is within ourselves. It is also a flow between ourselves and other people. So the flow is everywhere. Now, <clears throat> When we talk about the flow of this energy, the terminology that we use is actually the same when we talk about energy exchange in all of its manifestations. We are mostly unaware of the similarity or the sameness of the terminology. So, that is what I want to focus on as the final point in our discussion about this chapter. In the material world, what is the energy exchange? When we talk about materialistic things, the exchange is currency, it's money, it's finance, it's economics. When we say that someone is rich, we may use the word affluence. Affluence is a flow. That is the original meaning of the word affluence. 
So the word currency comes from that. Currency is related to the current. Economics can be seen as the currents, the flow, inflow and outflow of the exchange of currency. All of these terms we know about in the material world, we use them all the time. We are mostly unaware that the same terms apply equally to consciousness, to the metaphysical, to the realm of the Tao. In that spiritual realm, we have two primary forms of spiritual currency. We choose how we spend time. Time is finite in this lifetime, therefore it is a precious resource. So here I want to note that we talk about spending money and then we talk about spending time. We use the same word, spend. It is no accident. And in case you're wondering, this is exactly the same in both English and Mandarin. In Mandarin, when I say spend money, I'll say hua qian. When I say spend time, I'll say hua shi jian. In both cases, the word spend is being used. That is because time is the currency of the spiritual realm. It is the currency of the spiritual realm because we have a finite amount of time in this life lifetime to work on ourselves. Now, I mentioned there are two primary forms. What is the other one? Well, we choose what we pay attention to, one among many. Let me explain. Note the word, pay attention. The word pay, we say this all the time. We forget that we normally use the word pay in a monetary sense in the material world. Pay a fee, pay a fine, pay this, pay that. Pay for dinner, pay a loan. We forget pay attention. It means attention is the other major form of spiritual currency. Why is a currency in the spiritual realm? Because spirituality is a current, because the Tao is a flow. This is why we have to pick and choose what we think about and what we do, how we utilize the Tao. And there it is, utilizing the Tao. It means we have to be mindful about what we spend our time doing. If we're wasting time, it's the spiritual realm's equivalent of wasting that valuable currency to something that is not worthwhile to the soul. If we pay attention to everything, th we end up wasting time. And if we're indiscriminate in picking and choosing what we pay attention to, if we fail to direct our awareness, then again, we are wasting spiritual currency. Those who are not yet skillful in the spiritual practice usually end up wasting time because they pay attention to everything that comes their way. This can be, for instance, the quick fix solutions that we come across all the time that are being marketed to us all the time or get rich quick schemes which is the material world equivalent of that or you know techniques um, books seminars that promise quick results instant enlightenment all of these are things that come our way they are not necessarily the Tao. They may be side roads or shortcuts that end up wasting time. Now, 
back to the idea of affluence. I talked about affluence being the original meaning being flow, a rich flow, an abundant flow. In the material world, affluence is the abundant flow of money. In the spiritual realm, affluence isn't money at all. But the abundant energy flow that we are able to cultivate as the result of using our spiritual currency wisely. The abundant flow of energy in the Tao. So this is all wrapped up in the imagery of the river. What river? The river flowing through the heart of the valley. So at the very end, we go right back to the beginning with the spirit of the valley. The valley spirit that flows continuously, manifesting as a river that gives life to all the living things in the valley. Powerful metaphor. And now you and I have the clarity to see it in its entirety. This concludes our discussion of all the lines in Tao Te Ching chapter 6. We are now ready to move on to the paraphrase. When we do the paraphrase, we're demonstrating our understanding by expressing the original meaning with modern language. Section one, we have the valley spirit undying is called the mystic female. Having gone through our discussion, you now know exactly what the valley is and what the mystic female really stands for. How do we paraphrase it? Here's what I would like to offer. In the Tao, there is an essence that we describe as being like the spirits of a valley. It is ever present and everlasting. It is wide open, receptive, and accepting. It is the source of all life, and it nurtures all the living things that thrive in the valley. We call it the mystic female. Let us move on to section two. It talks about the gate of the mystic female and how that is synonymous with the root of heaven and earth. And now we know exactly what those terms refer to, the ultimate source of everything. What about the paraphrase? I would like to offer the following. This essence is the source of creation. Just as the female gives birth to new life, the door of the mystic female is the origin of everything in the universe. In our own lives, this essence is the origin of all manifestations, good or bad. It is everything we create and experience. All the positive things, all the negative things, it's all included. Everything is everything. Now, let's go to the last section. It flows continuously, barely perceptible. Utilize it, it is never exhausted. The most important concept of all, the flow. The flow of the Tao the flow of everything that comes from the source, the flow of creativity, the flow of consciousness, or as I call it, the stream of consciousness. 
inexhaustible, infinite, with no limit at all. Let me offer the following paraphrase to encapsulate the last section. We cannot perceive this essence directly, but it is there nevertheless. It is a continuous flow in life, working silently yet effectively behind the scenes. The more we understand it, the better we can use it. It is incredibly powerful and it can never be exhausted. So I think that by having gone through the discussion that we did, you can see the power of this imagery for yourself. The more you understand it, the more clearly you can see all the implications of the valley, of the mystic female, of the root of heaven and earth, the more you experience that power yourself and the more you naturally know how to utilize it for your own life. So I think without exaggeration, I can safely point to chapter six as one of my favorites because, because of how, how powerful that is in only six lines. So the very last part of what we need to do for chapter six is the full circle to kind of wrap everything up as a nice neat little package. The very first line of chapter six talks about the valley spirit undying. In other words, now you know what that really means, the soul is immortal. Then the very last line says, use it, it is inexhaustible. That is talking about the infinite Tao, the infinite source of everything, including everything we do, we think about, we feel, it is all there. So let's do the full circle. In the last lines of Tao Te Ching chapter six, Lao Tzu says the universal source of life, the mystic female can never be exhausted. Now we know this to be true, that even science is telling us that wherever conditions permit life, life will begin. Life will take root anywhere that it can. It is ready to take root upon fertile soil. Sometimes scientists even find that in the most unlikely circumstances, harshest environments, even there, it is possible for life to begin. So we link this back to the beginning and see the statement that the valley spirit never dies. So this, we can see these are related in meaning. These are connected as a whole. And the connection, I think, is quite clear. The valley spirit reflects the Tao and further reflected in us is unlimited. It is infinite. We tap into it when we become like the valley, nurturing people and giving life to our karmic manifestations. One of the ways that we can do that, as I mentioned, is to enter the valley, tap into the flow state, to be in the zone, to go into a groove where you can be one with your activities, lose all sense of time, produce results that are phenomenal, expending little or no effort. And all of that encapsulated in the last two lines of chapter six. It flows continuously, barely perceptible. Utilize it, it is never exhausted. We've all seen these lines before, but I think you would agree with me 
that now that we have gone through the entire chapter in great detail and depth, that these lines will never look the same to any of us ever again. Now, this is the uh, final slide of chapter six. We are getting close to the end of our time together today. So now is the perfect time for us to jump to the summary, to summarize chapter six. The second part of it, I think not a big surprise, our summary is about flowing with the Tao. And not a big surprise that we would start with the flow state. And getting into the flow state, we have different expressions like enter the valley, tap into the Tao, be in the flow. I want to take it another step further and to say it's not just enter the valley, tap into the Tao, be in the flow. It is to say you are the valley, be the valley, be the Tao be the flow be one with them be them and what this means as we talked about complete immersion and effortless excellence and this goes into number two the stream of consciousness this is where we talk about spiritual currency and we talk about the importance of mastering your control over your mind. The mind originates from the spirit. You have the ability to direct the flow, which can be with or against the Tao. I cannot emphasize that enough. So you must direct the flow of your mind. You must take control. In the Tao Te Ching, the metaphor for taking control is to say, you are sovereign. You are the king. You are the master of your own destiny. You have the birthright to take complete control of it. Lastly, I want to talk about the infinity of the Tao, the inexhaustible flow. And I mentioned spiritual currency just now. Remember the two most important forms that spiritual currency takes. Spending time, spending money. The terminology is the same, suggesting the underlying unity of the concepts. If we weren't aware of this previously, now we are. So to be economical, to be thrifty, with money maps to being wise in spending the time that we have in this world. We all have a finite number of years ahead of us. The only question is, can we utilize what is left, what remains in the wisest possible way, in the optimal way? Spend the spiritual currency of time wisely. Then let's not forget the other part. What do we pay? What do we pay exactly? Not monetarily, but what attention do we pay to what things that come our way? The other powerful spiritual currency is what you and I pay attention to. Paying attention to the right things avoids the wasting of the valuable, precious spiritual currency of time. So we must be mindful of that as well. So that, I would say, that in a nutshell will be the most important message from today. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.